Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I'm Joel. And we decided we would do our best books of 2022 so far video together because you've read a lot this year, more certainly more than me. You said you're on track to read 100 books this year, right? 100 books, yes. I have not managed to do that since I started keeping track of how much I read in a year, which I think happened in 2008. I, I think that's when I first joined Goodreads and started keeping track. So... Well done on you. Thank you. But anyway, uh, we decided to do something a little different. I have never separated nonfiction from my best of list, but we were talking about it last night and we decided we were going to do that. So we have a nonfiction list and a fiction list. Yes. And let's start with the nonfiction. Do you want to go first or second? Uh, go for it. Okay. My first in the nonfiction section, I have five, is How to Resist Amazon and Why by Danny Kane. Local economies, data privacy, fair labor, independent bookstores, and a people-powered future. It's the fight for all of those things. Danny Kane is the co-owner of the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, which we need to get to we someday. Do. We kind of have vague plans to do it at some point in the future. Uh, but fantastic store. It actually won Bookstore of the Year from... I forget who. But it did just win that. And it's a fantastic book. It is really small. I actually listened to it on audio. And he reads it himself, and it's a really great primer. I'd say if you are already sort of anti-Amazon like we are, it just affirms all of your reasons for being anti-Amazon. But I'd say maybe share this with other people and get the message out there about why maybe they shouldn't support Amazon and should look for alternatives and why it's good to support local bookstores, even though it's easy to focus on the money, but uh, that money goes back into your community and does really good things. And he really lays out a great case for why. That's important. So, How to Resist Amazon and Why is my first. And we're starting from the bottom going up yes. to number one. Okay, yeah. so my number five in nonfiction is Gender Queer. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this book. Uh, it actually kind of taught me a lot since mm -hmm. um, I, I have been in the gay community for a very long time, but there are so many new things happening with gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, this really taught me a lot. This is one of the most banned books, so it made me really happy to read it and have it in the top of my pile. So yeah. I really enjoyed it. And it's so silly, ultimately, that it's so banned, because it's really, it's just about figuring out who you are and where you fit on the yeah. spectrum. And it's a graphic novel, which mm. has always a little bit intimidated me, because mm. I was never a comic book person, but it was fun. I liked it. Yeah, I grew up a comic book person, so. <laughs> All right, my next one is Paying the Land by Joe Sacco. This is also a graphic, uh, not, not a graphic novel because it's nonfiction, but it's a graphic look at the history of indigenous populations in Canada, specifically in the far north, and how they were left alone for a really long time, but then once the government realized there were resources in that area that they wanted, how systemically and systematically they were taken advantage of and made to become dependent on the government to survive. It does occasionally read a little bit like a textbook, but a really interesting textbook. So I really enjoyed it and I would recommend it. So that's my next one. All right. My number four was In Cold Blood by Truman mm -hmm. Capote. Uh, I've always kind of was fascinated by the story. I grew up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Actually, my next door neighbor growing up lived three, four houses down from the Cutter House. Which is uh, so creepy. <laughs> which was the family that was murdered yeah. in Garden City, or outside Garden City, Kansas. Uh, Truman Capote is a great writer. It is a really good book. Um, I re I've i seen the movie, but I wanted to read the book. And the book was really good. It goes into detail about the two guys who did the murders and then what happened when they got caught up to the execution. Yeah. Um, so I was fascinated with it and really enjoyed the book. I read it in high school, not for high school. I was that person who <laughs> went and made my own reading list, and I, I read it then, and I haven't read it since, and I would actually really like to reread it. It's good. It's very good. My next one is Amateur, A Reckoning with Gender, Identity, and Masculinity by Thomas Page McBee. I actually just read this in June. It was one of the most recent books that I did read. It's a very short audio. I listened to it on Scribd. And I would recommend it. It's, it's basically, you could do it in a single afternoon. I did it over the course of two days, but it's a really good book because it takes a very interesting look at gender and the ways we construct gender and 
kind of how silly they are. And one thing I didn't mention in our June wrap-up, which I will link down below, is that something that has really kind of broken my heart a lot lately is you hear a lot of people within the LGBTQ community trying to, like, other trans people. And one thing they always say is, like, well, you can't, call, like, a trans man can't, you, you have to make a distinction. Like, a trans man is a trans man and a man is a man. Or a trans woman is a trans woman and a woman is a, a woman. And they're, they're two separate things. You can't put them together. And it just breaks my heart because I read this book and I found so much to relate to. And I don't 100% have the same experience as Thomas, Thomas Page McBee, but I don't 100% have the same experience of a lot of other people. And I can read this and I can find parts of it that I can relate to and appreciate. And I don't think Thomas Page McBee is any less of a man than me just because he's transgender. And I think I would certainly stand shoulder to shoulder with him as a man and support him and his journey. So just wanted to throw that out there since I didn't mention it in our June wrap up. It's a really great book. I would recommend it. Uh, my number three is The Deviant War by Eric Cervini. Which I need to read. Which is really good. Um, he actually has a show on... I It's on Discovery Plus. Discovery. That's how we've been watching it, okay. but I don't know what it's actually on. Called The Book of Queer. Mm. It's a little over the top, but it's really good as far as educational. Mm. Uh, the facts are real. They just took some um, artistic... There are a lot of jokes. Yes. A lot of jokes. Okay. Um, the Deviant War is about a... Uh, Thomas Kameny, is it? Thomas Kameny, yeah. who was a astro... or a, He worked for NASA. Yeah, That's NASA and astrology. Yeah. Uh, and how he, the um, government wouldn't allow gay people to mm. hold the position. Regardless of what a clean record they have, mm. they couldn't do it. So his entire fight was his life's work of getting NASA and the government people to allow gays and lesbians into mm. the workforce, even if it's a high security. Yeah. And he basically is credited by a lot of people as the father of the gay rights movement, because when he was forced out, he got involved in activism. And so I really need to read that book. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the education part, I loved it. Yeah. My number two nonfiction book is Gay Like Me, A Father Writes to His Son by Richie Jackson, which is another book that I just finished. Uh, it's the last audiobook that I, li I listened to. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about it since I just talked about it a lot in my or our June reading wrap up. But it's a really beautiful book about a father who's he who is gay and his son has just come out as gay as he's about to go off to college. So he writes this sort of message to his son about what it is to be a gay person in America and to be part of the LGBTQ community and how to help other people fight for representation and how to protect yourself in a society that still wants to get you. And his message really has proven to be true in recent weeks with all the Supreme Court rulings because he was essentially telling his son, it's like, it's easy to think that you are living in a better world, but people are still out to get you and you need to be careful at all times. And it's unfortunate, but it's unfortunate. It's true. Uh, so I really, I guess enjoyed is not the right word, but it was a very good book. So, and it's also short. It was maybe three and a half hours. So, yeah. And I'm currently reading that. So right. I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah. Um, my number two is where the deer and antelope play by Nick mm -hmm. Offerman. Mm -hmm. A really great book on him. Just talking about what's happening in the world today. He talked about his politics, his stance with um, there. It's during the COVID epidemic. Yeah. Uh, he and his wife Megan Mullally uh, are on a cross country tour in their RV named the Nutmeg, That's which so I cute. love. So cute. And uh, it's just a great book. He has some good points that he brings out, and it's it's funny. Yeah. He is such a charming person. I think if we were doing a top six, it probably would have been my six. It's a really cute book and somebody just recommended this morning um the book about nick and megan's relationship yeah which we saw in a store once and didn't get so we should look for that because they're adorable uh my number one non-fiction book of 2022 so far is ma and me by putsada rang which is another book that i read recently we talked about in our june reading wrap-up so i won't spend a whole lot of time talking about it now but it's a really beautiful book about putsada rang is the daughter of cambodian refugees who came to this country and she is also a lesbian so it's about the generational divide between her and her parents and how her sexual identity caused a rift between her and her mother over time. It's a really beautiful story and she's a very intelligent writer. She is a journalist and it's, it's just a really beautifully put together 
book. I would absolutely recommend it. So that's those are my top five nonfiction books. And my number one pick was All the Young Men by Ruth Coker Bur mm -hmm. Burks. And um, what I talked about in our uh, Pride Reads, mm -hmm. uh, I loved this book. Mm -hmm. Just the heart of this woman who helped so many people where nobody else would. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a hard book to read. Uh, it's a lot of death. But it's fascinating. Really yeah. cool. I think I'm going to try to read it in the fall. Because I, I do definitely want to read it. Let's go into fiction. I have a top 13 for fiction. Do you, you have a top 10? I have top 10. Top 10? All right. So I'm going to go first. I couldn't narrow it down to just 10. My 13th book is Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. I had started this book last year and had to put it down because I was participating in the BookTube Prize and needed to get a lot of reading done and I had desperately wanted to get back to it so I revisited it this year. It's a really great story. To me, it's like the version of the story about um, the, sort of the border crisis and migrant issues that people wanted when they picked up American Dirt by Janine Cummins but that's, I'd say that's a terrible book. <laughs> this is a really great book written by someone who is, actually knows a lot about the migrant issues and who has a lot of empathy for people in the same situation and I feel like it would be very difficult to read this book, which is very small by the way, and not have empathy for people in that situation. It's really great. So that's my number 13. Should I keep going just until yep. we get to a number 10? Yep, All right. So my number 12 book is Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin. It feels weird that this isn't in the actual top 10 because James Baldwin is a tremendous writer. I've read Giovanni's Room, If Beale Street Could Talk. So this was might have been my third, might have been my fourth. He's a fantastic writer. I really love everything that he has done that I've read so far, and I definitely want to read more. Actually, I ordered another James Baldwin book this morning from Montana Book Company because they're doing a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. But anyway, I really liked it. You can sort of tell that it was his first book. He mentions in, I think, the foreword, that, or it mentions on the back of the book, James Baldwin said, Mountain is the book I had to write if I was ever going to write anything else. It is a very personal story. It's inspired by his own life. And you can sort of tell that, but I didn't get the same sucker punch that I did from his other books that I've read. And I think that's the only reason it's not in my top 10 so far. Um, but a really great book. He's a tremendous writer. Uh, and then my number 11 book is Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, which I really did enjoy. I do think there are two different storylines, one set in the past and one in modern day Hollywood. And I did think the modern storyline was a little bit weaker, which is why it's low on my list. But... I think the Hollywood storyline did add something to the book as a whole in the end. And for that reason, uh, I think it's really worthy of this spot on my top 13. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where it ends up at the end of the year. Because 13 through 5, I feel like, could get pushed down the list as the year goes. But uh, right now, it feels like a solid, solid list. Uh, that takes me to my top 10. Okay, go for number 10. For number 10? All right, my number 10 is Agatha of Little Neon by Claire Luchette, which is a really spare book. Um, hadn't been talked about a whole lot, and I just really loved it. It is about a nun whose order in Buffalo is closed. She is sent with her um, fellow sisters to work in a halfway house in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and she starts having time to herself because the local elementary, uh, high school, the local high school, hires her to teach a math class and she actually gets some time on her own and she is forced to sort of reckon with the way they live their lives whether or not they're qualified to do this job of caring for people in a halfway house and what her faith has done for her and how working in the convent has or as a nun has allowed her to hide from parts of herself that she hasn't wanted to deal with and start thinking about whether or not she wants to deal with them it's a really great book i hope more people discover and uh, it, it's fantastic i think so all right what did you uh, my number 10 is under the poacher's moon by w aaron van driver mm -hmm. uh, as a, a first book for him mm -hmm. and i wanted to give it a try it was about a woman who got a divorce and wanted to go on a journey so she went for a safari and while on a safari um learned that uh there were a lot of poachers out there poaching rhinos. And then it also goes into poaching rhinos to poaching elephants, which I love my elephants. Yeah. And um, kind of what she did, and of course it was very fiction, to help stop the 
the trade of cutting off the rhino's horns. Um, so under the poacher's moon is a full moon is when the poachers come out and slaughter the animals to get the ivory or the rhino. So it is kind of hard, but a um, little very fantasy-ish, but um, I enjoyed it. It sounds really interesting. It's fun. And it does sound like something that you would definitely like, yeah. especially since Joel loves okay. elephants. Uh, my number nine is Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature last year. I've talked about it a fair amount over the last month, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it. But basically, it is about a, girl, a teenager in 1954 in San Francisco who is the daughter of two immigrants from China. They both came over as students and ended up staying. And now, because of the Red Scare, her father's citizenship is being threatened. Fears of communism are running rampant, even though I think at this point McCarthyism had sort of calmed down or died down. And at the same time, she is discovering that she is a lesbian. And her story about realizing what her life is going to be like as a lesbian goes parallel to the uh, Red Scare because she realizes if she is arrested or found out publicly, she could lose her job and not be able to get another job. She could, a lot of bad things could happen to her and she sees the way in which, so she, the Telegraph Club is a lesbian club in San Francisco that she becomes sort of intrigued with and starts to visit with a friend of hers from school. And she starts to meet other lesbians and sort of sees how they live and how they have to hide and how they have to have spaces like the Telegraph Club where they can actually be open and be themselves. And it's a really beautiful book, very well-researched historical fiction. And I look forward to reading more books by Melinda Lowe in the future as well. I thought it was just absolutely fantastic. Loved it a lot. All right, my number nine is Chef's Kiss by T.J. Alexander. Just a sweet little romance, which I normally do gay romance, but this was a female gay romance. You have a agender, transgender, and a lesbian, and it deals with being a pastry chef, working in a kitchen, doing um, YouTube videos for cooking, everything I'm really kind of passionate about. And it's just a really sweet story, um, but it kind of goes in hard, which I appreciated, on one of the person's pronouns were they, them, and people wouldn't do it. And even corporate would say, no, nah, you can't do this. And it was their fight against the corporation to say, yeah, you need to do this. Yeah. So um, it was fun, romantic, but it had a point, and yeah. I loved it. And it is, I think, important to sort of get in the head of someone, because I, I mean, I'm guilty of this. For some, I have had a hard time adjusting to they, them as pronouns, just because, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it, but it's important to experience something like that because it lets you know, and that, that, this is also about gender queer, it lets you know why these pronouns matter to people and why it really matters to get them right. And so I like that. I need to read that book. I really want to. It's fun. Yeah. We are at number eight, which for me is Train Dreams by Dennis Johnson. I read this sort of spur of the moment because I did read it when it came out in 2000. Twelve, I want to say. I talked about it when I did my deep dive into the Pulitzer year of 2012 because that is the last time that there was no winner for the prize and it was 10 years ago as we were getting ready to announce this year's Pulitzer Prize. So I did a look back and Train Dreams, it was a finalist. Obviously the board did not select from the finalists and it was the book that I think should have won that year. And I, in talking about it, it's a very small book. It is like... Because you listened to the audio as well, yeah. right? It's like, what, two hours? Two or three hours. Yeah, it's 116 pages. It's only small. You could dip it in your coffee. <laughs> and uh, I, as I was talking about it, I decided I really wanted to reread it. Somebody pointed out the actor Will Patton read the audio, so I listened to the audio. He was good. I, you know, I enjoyed was. the book. Yeah. It's a, it, a small book. It packs a huge emotional punch. It's very sad. Very sad. But it also really deals with a lot of kind of great Americana, which is sort of the point of the Pulitzer Prize, ostensibly. So it just feels mystifying that it didn't actually win. And I'm glad I reread it. I am a fan of this book. So that's my number eight. I recommend it, too. Yeah. Uh, my number eight is Kindred by Octavia Butler. I read this on uh, the Montana Book Company's Challenge, and I'm glad I did. It was really, really good. It deals a little bit with time travel, which kind of weirded me out in the beginning, but and how it played out was 
Her writing was beautiful. Her characters were great. Just a great story. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have it on your list. Yeah, because the challenge for Montana Book Company is to read a book by Octavia Butler. And so I think we, as we were looking at her books, that's the one we both zeroed in on. You just got to it way before I did. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> so I haven't read it yet. It's kind of the basis, basic premise of it is this woman from 1972, uh, African-American woman married to a white man mm -hmm. and somehow gets time traveled back into slavery days. And she has to change her mindset when she goes back there just to keep her from being beaten. Mm -hmm. And it was really sad, mm -hmm. horrific, but um, she really, the character really pulls it all together and makes it a great book. You were talking about it as you were reading it, and it sounded really interesting. So I can't wait to get to it. I might try to do it before summer is over. Um, I need to anyway, by the end of the year. Where are we? Number seven. Uh, my number seven is Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. I really struggled with my top seven. I think if you catch me on a different day, anything from here on out could be in a different order. Originally, this was much higher in the top seven, and I kind of bumped it down. But it's a really great book. It is, like Train Dreams, it's very small. I think it's also about 116 pages. It also packs a really big emotional punch into a small page count. I think both of those books make a great case for why novellas can be so good and why they can be really important. So a lot of people have talked about small things like these on book two, but if you're unfamiliar, basically it is set in the mid 80s. I wanna say 1985, but that could be wrong. And it follows a man who uh, runs a coal company. And it's the dead of winter in a small Irish town. And it's his busiest time of year, but it's also um, a time when people don't have money. And it's a little bit about how difficult that is, but one day he goes to deliver coal to the local convent and he discovers something. And the rest of the book or novella is him trying to decide what to do with that information. And it really heavily deals with the control of organized religion and religious institutions over people and how hard it is to do the right thing when the majority of people just want you to be quiet. And it's, it's a really beautiful book. I would absolutely recommend it. And it, it, it'll be interesting to see how my top 20 books of the year go by the end. And like I said, Catch Me on a Different Day, small things like these might be much higher on my list. It's a great book. My next book was Perfect Peace by Daniel Black. I've enjoyed some of Daniel Black's books before and have enjoyed them, so I wanted to try this. It's about a mother who wanted a daughter so bad that when her fifth son was born, she told everybody it was a girl and raised this boy as a girl. And it kind of goes into the whole nature versus nurture. And... Um, things go bad. <laughs> it was a great book on understanding between the two and this little child growing up, not knowing who or what she was and how to deal with her life. Hmm. And um, really sweet book. So yeah. I liked it. It sounded really interesting because that's another one. You were talking about it as you were reading it and it sounds very interesting. It sounded really sad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very sad. And I think for that reason, I'm probably going to hold off for a little while. But, but it's good. It, but yeah, it sad is. Sad, but good. I, I might try to revisit it um, either early next year or later this year. Because it's on audio, right? Yeah. Yeah. I do want to read that. Daniel Black is a good author. We might be talking about him later on <laughs> in this video. We'll see. My number six is The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Kloon, which I just finished in June. And again, I feel like my top seven books could shuffle around a lot, but uh, I really enjoyed this. I listened to it on audio and we ended up getting a copy of the book just because we both liked it. You read it last year. Yeah. And if you're unfamiliar, because a lot of people have mentioned that they resisted reading this because it, I think it's a YA book technically, but I've seen stores shelve it in the adult area. So I don't quite know where it lies. I honestly, I think it's good for all ages. I agree, right. yeah. Yeah, but the premise of it is that this man who's a rule follower named Linus Baker uh, is sent to an island. His job is to evaluate magical children who are being cared for by this shady, sinister company. 
and see that they are being properly taken care of, that precautions are being taken and all of that stuff. So he is sent to an island with a top secret group of children who are supposed to be highly dangerous, but it's really about judgments and labels that you put on people and how you can be wrong and how, especially children, it's like, just support children, raise them to be good people and you won't have to be afraid of them so much. And I really like that message. Really great book. It's a little bit funny, a little bit serious, and I, I, I think it's great. I, it took me a long time to get around to it because I don't typically read kind of fantasy books, but it's a little light on fantasy, even though these kids are sort of magical and they're some of the creatures. Um, but I absolutely loved it. And uh, the hype is real because a lot of people have read this and loved it, but um, it's, a, it's a really great book. My next one is Joy Luck Club by mm -hmm. Amy Tan. I absolutely loved the movie, and yeah. I really wanted to read the book. The book is very different in oh, some good ways. Oh. It goes a little deeper into some of the stories, but oh, um, I loved both. I have always really admired and enjoy other people's cultures because they take family so so serious. I mean, mm. you you take care of your children, you take care of your parents, you take care of your grandparents. And that's what this is, and honoring your family. Mm. And um, I just thought it was a beautiful book. I love the movie. I've never, I haven't read the book yet, but it's on my list. You gotta read the book. I really gotta read the book, because read I love book. the movie. Yeah. All right, we are at number five, which for me, is The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle by Matt Cain. I really struggled. I finished this last night, and I really struggled with where to put this because I'm on an emotional high with it right now, and that is one reason why I say the books in my top seven might shuffle around over time, but I'm on a huge emotional high with this. You just finished this as well. Yeah. And it's a really great book, very much on par with a lot of the messages that you get from like The House in the Cerulean Sea, but basically, Albert Entwistle is um, a postal worker in the UK, and he is very shy, very withdrawn, doesn't get out, doesn't have any friends. He is very secretive about his life and does not, he goes out of his way not to talk to people at all. As he approaches his 65th birthday, he gets a letter saying that he is going to be forced to retire. And he, at first he's devastated about this, and then he actually loses his cat. Not a spoiler, it happens early on in the book. and. He starts thinking about his past, and he had a, a male lover when he was a teenager. And he starts thinking that he is going to look for him, and he starts opening up and talking to people. And he realizes that times have changed. You know, the way homosexuality was criminalized when he was a teenager is not necessarily the way it is right now. And he starts making friends, and he goes on this really surprising journey. The characters are all great, not just him. He's a great character. But like, he has a friendship with Nicole, who's a 19-year-old black uh, single mother trying to go to beauty school so she can eventually realize her own dream of opening her own salon. She's a great character. And all of the stories are just really great. And ultimately it's about living your truth and sort of being unapologetically you and how rewarding your life can be if you do that. And I think it was also really great because this was something that Erica from The Broken Spine gave us as part of a care package after we lost Guinness. And it was a really great choice. I know she worked with Abby from the Montana Book Company and Erica chose this off of the list because it also deals with processing grief in a way. And that was, it was just a really beautiful book for both of us. Sometimes you read the right book at the right time and this is absolutely that, I think for both of us. Yeah. So that is my fifth book right now. Um, my fifth book is The Hate You'd Give by Angie Thomas. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd seen this around a lot, and I know it was banned, and I think I read it during Banned Book Month. I absolutely loved it. I love the message. I love the strength of this young lady who really put herself out there mm. uh, to do what's right. Yeah. And as soon as I finished the book, we watched the movie. We did. And, um, Which both changed were, a little bit. Yeah, a little. Yeah, but it was good. But I enjoyed both of them. It was a good, strong message. Mm. Black Lives Matter. Absolutely fantastic. One thing I read, because I read it years ago when it first came out, um, one thing I really liked about it is that Angie Thomas really allows the characters to be complicated and is sort of unapologetic about that. Because usually in situations like that, it feels like the inclination is... So basically, uh, the protagonist has a friend that she hasn't seen in a while. 
who has gotten involved in a gang in the neighborhood where they live and they get stopped by a police car while they're, he's driving her home from a party and he gets shot by the police officer and killed. And I feel like other books, other writers would have wanted her friend who got shot and killed to be a sort of saintly character where you sort of realize, well, you know, he wasn't actually that bad. It was a total misunderstanding. He didn't deserve what he got. And Angie Thomas is sort of like, yes, he got involved in a gang. Maybe you should think about and understand why he got involved in a gang and why he felt he didn't have any choice in that matter. And also, also, at the end of the day, does it really matter if he was involved in a gang? He didn't deserve to get shot by that cop. And that, for me, because I, I found myself even, I was a little guilty as I was reading the book. I was like, well, he shouldn't have been involved in the gang. And then Angie Thomas kind of turned it on its head. And I was like, oh, you're right. And I, it, so it actually challenged me and perceptions and misperceptions that I had. And that's why I think it's a really great book. And it's a shame that it yeah. is banned I agree, so but, much. Um, good book. I think it should be read by adults and young mm -hmm. adults. Absolutely. I would certainly agree with that. We're at number four, which for me is Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. Classic LGBTQ fiction about a woman named Molly Bolt who is born in the 1950s. I think she's born in Pennsylvania and then they move to Florida and then she travels out from there. And it's about her life. It is so funny. I mean, right from the first chapter, you get engrossed in the book because in the first chapter, she is a child and she finds out that uh, a friend of hers at school is not circumcised. So they start charging money to the other kids to let them see it. And of course she gets in trouble for this. And, and when, uh, cause a kid tattles on her and she goes to war with that kid. So, I mean, right from the first chapter, you are really engrossed in her life. And it's just a funny book. Definitely has shades of fried green tomatoes for me. The back refers to it as um, her as a female Huckleberry Finn, and I think that's true as well. Also reminded me of Maurice. And it's just about her life and growing up as a lesbian, and she is sort of this, tempting to say stubborn, but really she just doesn't want to compromise in her life. And as she ages, other people in her life do compromise who they are in order to conform to society, and she tries to make her own way in the world and she's a really admirable character and I just love her. So I, I'm a little ashamed it took me this long to get around to this book. I love it, it's fantastic. I had mentioned that I think this would make a great audiobook with the right narrator and Kurt Anderson commented on my our June wrap up video today to say that Anna Paquin does the audio, which I wouldn't have expected, but actually sounds like it should be really yeah. perfect. So absolutely, I love this book and I would recommend it very much. My next book is Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. Uh, Aiden is a transgender male, and he writes a story of these boys, they kind of run the cemetery, and one is a transgender boy. In their culture, boys can't help the dead move from dead to the beyond the dead. And because he is born biologically a girl, all the people say, you can't do this, this isn't for you. And it's his story of growing up and he accidentally did send uh, somebody from the dead to the purgatory, purgatory? Oh, and okay. he had to get him out and so he could go on to the rest. It was really interesting to, about the culture as well, but also how this boy like, had to prove himself to all the other men in the uh, community that he is able to do this. Mm -hmm. It's actually... Um, an adorable book. I really enjoyed the author. I enjoyed the narrator. They really brought you in with the character development. It's a beautiful story. I love this book. And this was another one that we both discovered. I haven't read it yet. And actually, I didn't even know what it was about. That sounds interesting. Um, we both discovered because of the Montana Book Company's reading challenge for 2022, because one of the prompts is to read a book that was a Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association winner from the last five years. Yeah. And we were going through, and that was one of them. It was available, and uh, I think so. We just kind of, I think we chose it by default, right? Because it was available on audio, and I haven't listened to it yet, but you did, and actually really liked it. And then since you read it, we've heard from a lot of other people. A lot who have of loved people it. come out and said, "Oh, great, great book." Yeah. So I have another one of his on my mm -hmm. list. So I'm excited. And I think that's another reason we like to do the, the reading challenge, like the Montana book, because we've discovered so many great books that otherwise would not have come into our path because of it. Yeah. 
in the story. I even found that last year when I did this. I read mm -hmm. some amazing books. Like the Rain the, Heron. Rain Heron? Yeah. I never would have even thought of or taught. I've, I've really, in the last two years, have challenged myself mm -hmm. to read a little bit more outside of my comfort zone. Yeah. And I've benefited 100%. Um, even Kindred, Octavia Butler. The, never I've, read been meaning to get to her for years in heaven, but now I'm going to get the kick in the pants to do it. So And look, it's in my top five. Yeah, so bam. All right, and then my number three is Matrix by Lauren Groff, which I've been talking about a lot since January, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it here. It's a lesbian girl boss nun. What more do you need to know? I love it. Yeah, really good. How about you? I liked it. Yeah. And my number three is The Secret Life of Albert Antwistle. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg's already kind of gone through this. But my take on this was I loved the compassion his friends had for him. Yeah. Um, how he came out of his shell, how he grew, mm -hmm. how he believed in himself, and how he grew as a person. And found community. Community. Family isn't just who you were born with and who's mm -hmm. in your blood. Family is who is there and supports you day in and day out. Yeah. And he finds a family in this book, which yeah. is absolutely beautiful. For me, it has a little bit of a different vibe, but the same as A Man Called Ove. And there's a little bit in this book that even takes me to the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, which, which is love. one of our favorites. Yeah, we love that movie. And uh, it kind of brings to the point of family. Yeah. So highly, highly recommend this because yeah. it is absolutely beautiful. And again, it really, I think, was the right book at the right time for both of us. So really great. And then my number two is Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black. I said he'd be coming back. So we both read this book. Uh, it came out in January, I think. And basically the premise of it is that a father writes letters to his son who, who is gay and who he has become estranged from. And basically he had a very masculine idea uh, or a very specific idea of what the masculine ideal is, what, what a man should be and what a man should do. And his son being gay did not adhere to that. So they had a very tense relationship that became estranged from each other. Now he is dying. So he writes a series of letters to his son sort of explaining his life and his choices and what was expected of him as a child and how the sections where he's talking about his own childhood you can see he used to be very carefree and emotional and loving. There's a section where he makes a pound cake with his grandmother that is just adorable. And pound cake, it, it, like, it comes back toward the end. There's a really beautiful full circle with that. And over time, as he became an adolescent, all that love and joy kind of got beaten out of him. And he felt like he had to be a man. He had to provide. He couldn't be emotional. He had to squelch all of that stuff down. And... He's basically just explaining his life to his son, anticipating that when he dies, his son will get these letters. And he is not asking his son to, for to forgive him. He's not asking him to feel bad for him, hence the title. But he does want him to understand. And especially he wants his son to know that he does love him and wishes that he had been a different person and been able to do better by his son. And it's a really beautiful message. I love complicated family dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really primed for this. And then the racial element um, of how it is not just to be a man, but to be a black man in this country over time and how things have changed and how things are still sort of the same. It's just a really beautiful book. You did an interview with Erica yeah, uh, with uh, Daniel Black, and I'll put a link to that down below too, because he's a fascinating man. And I'm not going to say too much more about it because I have a feeling it's going to come up again. <laughs> but yeah, it's a really great book. I would absolutely recommend it. And my number two is Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to expect when I got this. It's about two fathers, uh, one black, one white, different backgrounds. And both their sons were a couple and they were brutally murdered. Mm -hmm. And it was the two fathers going and getting revenge on the people that killed their sons. Mm -hmm. It's very brutal. It's graphically really, really uh, intense, but beautifully written. The characters are, you just fall in love with the characters. They're doing bad mm -hmm. things, but you fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. Great book, uh, very emotional. Um, it's also how two fathers had to come to term with their sons being gay, being murdered, 
and understanding that. Mm -hmm. And they also had to come to terms with each other because they were both very different people. They did not like each other in the beginning. Uh -huh. And that's how they came to terms with each other. Read it when you're not feeling down and you're in a good mood. Mm -hmm. It'll bring you down, but it's worth the read. Great book. I had it on my Pride Month pile of possibilities, and a couple of people commented to say, don't do that one now. <laughs> and even you said, no. like, not not this month. No, I so, wouldn't let them. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but I do really want to read it. I've heard great things about it since it came out. Uh, Charlie from the Montana Book Company is a huge fan. Abby from the Montana Book Company is a huge fan. I've heard great things about S.A. Cosby's other book, which I think is called Blacktop Wasteland. But I want to do this one first. And I've just I've heard really great things. S.A. Cosby is a good follow on Twitter as well for whatever that's worth. Um, so yeah, I will absolutely get to it. All right, we're at number one. Number one. My number one really can't be anything other than Beloved by Toni Morrison, which I read with Amelia Reed's in February, I think. And actually, Amelia Reed's recommended Gay Like Me by Rachel Jackson, so I should mention that real quick. Um, thank you, Amelia. We read this. It's a fantastic book. There's a reason it is a classic. It's such a great book. It was a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. A few years after it was published, Toni Morrison won the Nobel Prize for Literature. It's a fantastic book. I feel like it's a prickly book. It sort of deliberately doesn't want to give you an easy reading experience. And as such, it doesn't feel pleasant to read it. But that's the point. And I think Toni Morrison absolutely achieves that. Because of that, I would say my emotional number one for the year is Don't Cry For Me. But I don't think I could say anything other than Beloved as my number one because it's just such a great book so well done if you're unfamiliar i don't know where you've been but if you're unfamiliar with it it's the story of setha who is an escaped slave she is sort of dealing with grief it's not really a secret but she murdered her daughter to keep her out of slavery when she was two years old and is sort of unable to really process the grief of that and her grief over her lost daughter is tied in with the lasting implications of slavery. Her daughter, is named Beloved, shows up at the house as a ghost of a young woman and complications ensue. And it's really about how you need to deal with the lasting implications of slavery and grief and trauma in order to move on. And that is something that America has not done. And it's, just, it's a really great book, very beautiful. So absolutely, I don't think there's anything else I could put in the number one slot other than that. And my number one is going back to Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black. Uh, this book really moved me. I have a beautiful relationship with my father, but mm -hmm. I did not with my mother. So this kind of helped me kind of open up my mind that maybe my mother growing up had some different ideas in her mind and that may have caused a little tension between us. Mm -hmm. But I did have the opportunity of sitting down with Daniel Black in an interview. He is adorable mm. charismatic mm. funny charming, charming yeah. everything and we talked about why he wrote this book and and a little bit of it was when he is a teacher and he's also a, a preacher a lot of kids didn't have a good relationship with their father and so he wanted to write a book on maybe the father has something going on that you don't know about um, what I did learn from uh, Dr. Black was there's a sequel coming out to this book. So exciting. And, <laughs> and it's going to be the son reacting to the letters the father wrote. Because mm. you don't hear what the son has to say. You only hear what the father has to say. It's, yeah. it's from that point of view. So the next one, I am mm. so looking forward to this book. Yeah. It's going to be as emotional as this. Mm. And um, speaking of Dr. Black, he says he's very excited about writing that sequel. Yeah. And... Um, if you haven't read this, go out and get it. Yeah. It's I, amazing. I think the last hour of the book, we did together. I So I listened yeah. to it after you had already read it. I was I only had about an hour left, and we were getting in the car to drive to Helena. So you said you wanted to listen to it again. So we listened to it together, and I think I just, I like sobbed. <laughs> we both sobbed down the highway. Yeah. Not an ideal way to drive, but it really worked out well. And I think once, as soon as they announce when the sequel is coming, that's like instant pre-order for me. Yes. Yeah, because I, I can't wait for that. Really good book. Very highly recommended. I do. Yeah. Um, if I hadn't read Beloved, that would absolutely be my number one book of the year. Because I did like this so much and I was able to speak with Dr. Black about some other things he'd written, he actually suggested uh, mm. Perfect Peace to me. 
it was just a beautiful book. I love his writing. I love his characters. He's a very empathetic person. I mean, I didn't speak to him, but from watching the interview and from reading this book, you can tell he is someone who will really think about how other people experience the world. And it, that that's just, I, I love that. I, I try to do that, and sometimes I struggle. So. Yeah. So I have felt my first six months have been very successful in a lot yeah. of my reads. I agree. I've learned a lot, loved mm -hmm. a lot, cried a lot, and yeah. um, had some. Um, I can't wait to see what the next six months bring. Yeah, I think it's really good. I think the fact that there's so much quality here in these books, it's going to be really interesting to see where all of these books end up by the end of the year. I can't imagine anything pushing number one out. I don't think out. this is going to push this too far from the top for me. Yeah, that absolutely. And like I said, if I hadn't read Beloved this year, that would absolutely be. I just feel like I, it's such a good book that even though my heart says don't cry for me, everything that Toni Morrison did here is so good that I feel like I can't put anything else in number one. And I, so I think those are that's a pretty solid top two for me. It'll, I don't think that's going to change. But we'll see. Yeah. Stay tuned. All right. All right. Well, uh, we will leave it at that. Thank you for joining in. You bet. Thank for you. For this. As always, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for joining in. Thank you. And I will be back. Until next time, happy reading. Thank you.